Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Mary, Greg, and I are just delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a blessed Sabbath. We please that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath school lesson. Mary, will you invoke God's presence and God's blessings on this morning? It would be my privilege. Let's bow our heads. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful for the Sabbath day in which we can come together and open your word and hear you speak to us. And so we come before you now asking for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit who speaks to our hearts and our minds. We need him now to open up your word to us and to help us see how you want to apply it to our lives on a practical daily basis so that we can honor and glorify you and bless others. To this end, we pray and we ask that you please bless everyone who is watching and everyone who's participating in this Sabbath school. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Um, In this lesson, in, in this particular lesson, and by the way, I, I've already mentioned this is the last lesson of the quarter, a quarter that really significantly concentrated in uh, hours to understand how God perceives and understands um, managing. We managing through God, with God, for the master till he comes. And so, the memory verse for lesson number 12, which is really the last lesson of the quarter, is found in Matthew 25, 21, and I just think that it's so appropriate. So, God tells us in Matthew 25, 21, his Lord said to him, this is God speaking, and if you know Matthew 25, you, you, you know the setting. It says, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful, you were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I don't want to really go any further in this particular verse. We will discuss that towards the end. But as a brief overview of this week's Sabbath school lesson, I want to propose the following to you. Because we are sinful human beings, and as such, we cannot earn salvation. The Bible uses the hope of reward, as we have read in our memory verse, as a motivation for faithful living. So we may receive God's grace. Whatever we receive is always and only from God's grace. As the scripture makes it clear in Deuteronomy chapter 28, or Psalms chapter 58, or Malachi chapter 3, and we've studied those during the course of the quarter, and Romans chapter 2, God promises his people earthly and eternal rewards. These rewards, as, Paul, as Paul tells us, in Romans chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, are given to them according to their deeds. Here's what Paul tells us. Romans chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. God will render to each one according to his deeds. Verse 7. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good. I love that phrase. It's patient continuance in doing good. Seek for glory, seek for honor and immortality. It is the and eternal life that provides us with ample motivation to be faithful until death, so we may acquire the crown of life, as God promises in Revelation chapter 2, verses 10, and Revelation chapter 21. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 6, and I'm not reading those, that 
People who are dead in sin cannot render faithfully. They cannot render faithfulness. They cannot be faithful to God. For that matter, as the prophet Isaiah tells us in Isaiah chapter 64, 10, neither can they or neither are they capable of good works. So how do we get into heaven? That's the question. The good news is that God raises us to a new life in Christ. As the Apostle Paul explains in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, Christ is the source of our salvation. Christ brings salvation by grace to those who surrender to Him. Christ works in us to will and to do of His good pleasure for the salvation of our souls and for the salvation of others. That is why Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Therefore, my beloved, says the apostle, as you have always obeyed, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for is good pleasure. That is a powerful statement. Those who are justified by faith in Christ are guaranteed to receive eternal life, as we read in Titus chapter 3, verse 7. Having been justified by Christ's grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. By the way, this has nothing to do with our works. This has all to do with God's grace through total faith in Him. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 10, that we are Christ's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This passage of, of Scripture tells me that grace makes us new creatures in Christ, refashioned, realigned to do good works. In the sense, all good works are fruits of faith that God gives, as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8. For by grace, says Paul, you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Therefore, as the prophet Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 26, 12, for God have also done all our work in us. God does it all. In us, the work of salvation are all established, formed, and made by God Himself. As by faith we enter into a relationship with God and we invite Him to dwell within us and guide us through our journey here on earth, we become God's stewards of all the material and spiritual blessings we receive from Him. Scripture tells us in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, 14, For all things come from God, and of you own we have given you. That really tells me that whatever we give to God is what we receive from God's hand. This includes obedience, faith, and salvation. Ultimately, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 6, the merit necessary for the redeemed to obtain the everlasting reward is also God's, who works all in all. Here's how Paul explains Philippians 2, 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So then, this week's Sabbath school study, we will study how God rewards us for our faithfulness, how God provides an assurance that we will re, uh, return for us so that he will return for us so we may enjoy an everlasting life with him in the new Jerusalem in heaven and afterward in the new earth. We will also study how we should focus on what God has entrusted to us and how we can use it for his glory. And finally, how we should keep our eyes fixed on the final prize the ultimate reward, which is a crown of righteousness and eternal life with God and those we love. Mary, 
God rewards faithfulness. Explain that to us. Well, Victor, thank you very much for the introduction that you gave to this week's lesson. And good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. So, Victor has already covered a little bit, but what is a reward? Well, it's generally defined as something given or received in return for service, merit, or hardship. But it can be positive or negative based upon good or evil done or received. And a reward is sometimes a stimulus to reinforce a desired response, Amen. as you covered earlier. Now, the first mention of reward in Scripture is in Genesis, and the last is in Revelation. In the King James Version, it's found more than 80 times. So let's read some of these verses, because obviously rewards is an important topic that God wants us to know about. So let's look at the first recorded instance in Genesis 15.1. Abram had just finished fighting the kings in Canaan. And after that battle that he had won, Scripture states, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. So our first introduction to God's concept of reward states that God is not only the one who's rewarding him, who has the authority and the resources and the power to do that, but he, God himself, is actually the exceedingly great reward. Now let's continue reading some other verses in Scripture. In Hebrews 11:6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, that God is God and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If we look at Revelation 22.2, this is the last verse in the Bible talking about rewards. It says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And in Isaiah 40.10, we read, Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. So what, what are some things that we learn from these verses? Well, first is God is the rewarder. He is the one ultimately who is giving out rewards. And when does God give these rewards? Well, in these verses that we just read, it's referring to the future at his second coming. Remember, Revelation 22.2 says, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me. So that's in the future. And Isaiah states, the Lord shall come, that's future tense, behold, his reward is with him. So if we're getting rewards in the future, does that mean we get any rewards now? Well, yes, the Bible does teach us that. God reassures us. In fact, when the rich young ruler left Jesus, he went away sorrowful because to him, the cost of eternal life was too much. Jesus told the disciples that it was hard for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And we read this in Luke 18 and 26, and then in 28 to 30. So when they asked, who then can be saved? If the rich can't be, who can? Then Peter said, see, we have left all and followed you. So he, meaning Jesus, said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present life and in the age to come, eternal life. So for Christ's followers, there are rewards now and in eternity. If we think of having peace with God, the removal of guilt and shame, peace in our heart, new motives, love, joy, patience, self-control, 
wisdom, discernment, conversation with God, and sometimes even specific interventions in our daily struggles, then aren't these rewards now? Life is absolutely better in a love-trust relationship with God here and now than living in the world without him. And lastly, who will receive rewards and what is it based on? Victor covered a little bit of this in Revelation 22, 2 again, to give to everyone according to his work. And in Psalm 58, 11, David wrote, surely there is a reward for the righteous. And then he wrote in Psalms 91, 8, only with your eyes will you look and see the reward of the wicked. So everyone, every human being will receive a reward, whether they're righteous or wicked. And Job 34, 11 says, he repays, that's God repays man according to his work, according to that man's work and makes man to find a reward according to his way. So what is the reward based upon? According to these verses, it's based on his work, his way, the way he lives, the way we live. Do you remember what Jesus said regarding the two resurrections in John 5, 28 and 29? He said, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So the reward is in accordance with the way we live our lives, our deeds, what we occupied ourselves with while we were on this earth. Now, Victor addressed something earlier, and I'm going to reiterate it. This concept of receiving a reward for the way you've lived your life doesn't advocate salvation by good works. And we've made that very clear. Thank you for sharing all the verses. I had Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, where by grace you have been saved through faith. So it's God working through us, transforming us. He's guiding us down a path that he has already prepared for us that results in good works. The good works is just the fruit of our relationship with him. Our only part is to exercise faith and choose to be cooperative, obedient, willing participants with him as he restores his image within us. So in summary... God is the ultimate rewarder. He longs to give us rewards now as well as in the future, eternity. And for, uh, the rewards are for our faithfulness to him. Every human being will receive a reward, either good or bad, based upon their faith relationship with God or the lack thereof. Bible prophecy informs us that the last generation on earth before Christ's second coming will go through a time of trouble that will be worse than anything ever experienced before. But we are to be encouraged by Christ's words in Matthew 5, 11 to 12. Jesus said, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And remember, earlier I read the first mention of reward was in reference that God is our, our exceedingly great reward. That's what we have to look forward to. Thank you, Mary. And, and, and Mary and Greg, you know, as I have um, studied and, and run and, and, you know, dedicated myself to understand this lesson well, it became very clear on the Sunday lesson, very clear to me, that my reward is either a gift mm -hmm. or it's the evaluation of my works. And if it is the evaluation of my works, it's condemnation for eternal death. But if it is God's gift, it's eternal life. Isn't that amazing? Amen. Amen. Just amazing. Amen.
Greg, everlasting life. We were just talking a little bit about everlasting life. What an incredible reward. Oh, it's incredible. And good morning and happy Sabbath to each of you. The lesson today for Monday is entitled Everlasting Life. And we've had such a wonderful introduction to this lesson so far. And the lesson, today's lesson, fits so perfectly with the theme of this week, which we know is titled Rewards of Faithfulness. So you're going to hear this throughout the lessons that we're teaching here comes down to faithfulness. But what is faithfulness? We're going to delve into this a little bit deeper here. But one of the rewards of faithfulness to God is the gift of everlasting life. It's not only a gift, but it's also a promise from God to us. And that said, let's also keep in mind that even though it is a gift and a promise from God, nevertheless, it's our own individual choice that God gives us as to whether we want to choose to accept it or reject that gift. So let's open our Bibles and let's begin with a well-known verse. For those of you who have been in the faith for some time, you know this verse very well. And for those who are new to the faith, this will become one of the pillars that you'll remember. Let's turn to John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whomever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life believes. Okay, well, let's explore that a little bit further. In the Greek lexicon, the word for believes in the Greek is pisteo. Pisteo, meaning to trust in Jesus or God as able to aid either in obtaining or in doing something of saving faith. So it's not just believing. This is a deep saving faith in God and Jesus Christ. So let's also keep in mind that everlasting life is available as a gift of love from God to all of humanity through Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's a choice, right? As we just read, sin either leads to death and no everlasting life, but in Christ Jesus we receive the gift, the promise of everlasting life. So the question is this, and Victor covered part of it here, and we're going to just delve in just a little bit deeper here. So how do we receive this gift, this promise? Well, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Think of it this way. The grace of God is, is giving this gift. He didn't have to give that gift. He gave it out of his love for us. So as Victor had said, we can't earn it, we can't buy it, we can't do anything to get that gift other than faith, our exercise of faith in God. So by believing in him, by faith, in his righteousness and accepting him as your Lord and Savior and by abiding in him, so how do we abide in him? By knowing him. We're going to take a look at a few verses from John. We're actually going to 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Okay, patience. Let's go a little further because John brings us further into what does he mean by this. So let's go to 1 John, the next chapter. Chapter 3, verse 24. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So what John is saying is, those who keep his commandments, that's how we abide in him. But let's go further. John takes us further in explaining that. And we'll look at the next chapter, 1 John chapter 4, 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. And then John tells us in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. This is about love. It's not about a legalistic obedience to the law. It's about Loving God 
And because we love him, we keep his commandments. Only by him working within us. So let's, let's move on. It is common in Christianity today to tend to water down those conditions of receiving this gift. A lot of times it's presented as just believe and you'll be saved. Well, that's why we're going through this lesson today. This gift of everlasting life, you just can't leave it right there. We have to look at what does that mean by believe. And we, we looked at that in John 3.16, the Greek lexicon that the word believe is pisteo. But believing goes much deeper than just that proclamation of believing. James 2, 19 through 20 tells us this. You believe that there is one God, you do well. But then he cautions you. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? As Mary had mentioned, that faith, those works are the fruit of of the faith that we have. They're the evidence of that faith. And so this belief that God is talking about is a deep-rooted belief called faith, which is evidenced by the fruit of our works, by our thoughts, our words, our actions, and loving God supremely and by loving our neighbor as ourselves. And this level of faith produced and refined through the process of sanctification, which is one, letting God speak to us by reading his word, Second, by developing that personal saving relationship with him, by speaking with the Lord through prayer. And then three, by letting the Holy Spirit dwell within us to repair, restore our hearts, our minds, and our characters that reflect God and his character to others. So, if we choose by faith Jesus Christ and his merits and what he did for us at the cross and what he will do in us, a process of restoration, by abiding in him, then we can claim this gift and promise of everlasting life. The promise of everlasting life is manifested and fulfilled in Jesus' promise to return again to bring us home. And in closing, I'd like to just look at several verses that prove that we can claim as promises made to us of Jesus' second coming and receiving everlasting life through him. So I'm just going to read through these verses. John 6.40 And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. Again, in the Greek lexicon, for this specific verse, it's talking about meaning to have a faith directed unto believing or in faith to give oneself up to Jesus. It's not just saying you believe. It's easy to say you believe. What's the substance of that belief? John 14, 1 through 3. I love this promise, and you will too. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That's that promise. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. That's a promise. We will be with him for eternity. Acts 1, 9 through 11. I love this. This is when Jesus ascends into heaven here. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. These are angels. And they, and they said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. That's the promise of Jesus' second coming. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's that promise of his second coming. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. That's the promise of everlasting life with God. Therefore, I love this, therefore comfort one another with these words. It's so important. And lastly, Revelation twenty two twelve, And behold, I am coming quickly. Promise. 
it's coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. So these are but a few promises that God has made to us regarding his second coming and everlasting life. And the question for each of us and for all of humanity is, what choice are we going to make? Are we going to accept or reject the gift of everlasting life with God? It's my prayer that we will accept this gift by faith in Jesus. Amen. 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 Greg, it's, it's just wonderful, isn't it? My faithfulness to God ensures my salvation. Amen. And he, Amen. in so many texts of the Bible, promised a salvation for all, for all mm -hmm. of us. Amen. And in Tuesday's lesson, not only is he providing a salvation, but he's saying, I want you to be with me, and I want you to like what I've made for you. Amen. And we are going to be together. And so, this is really about Tuesday, the new Jerusalem. Amen. And yes, I'm going to rush through it. There's so much in chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation. I would never be able to cover that adequately. And so I'm not really going to touch very much on the city that is described. In other words, the description of the exterior of the city or even the description of the inside of the city. I'm going to allow you to read that. But I want you to know what sort of lifestyle God has in place for you and for me. And in that regard, uh, let's, let, let's, uh, let's unpack uh, Revelation 21 and 22. The first thing, the introduction really, that I want to give you is this. The biblical description of the New Jerusalem is what Abraham saw by faith. So it really begins right there when God spoke to Abraham and talked to him about the New Jerusalem. Scripture tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 verses 10 that Abraham waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That is a remarkable act of faith. The New Jerusalem is God's masterpiece. It is being built by God for those who love him and keep his commandments. The New Jerusalem will be the home of God's faithful children in heaven during the millennium and afterward on the new earth for eternity. So what is it about the city that should excite you and me? Why should you and I should be excited about the city that God is making for us? What, is God, what has he promised us? Well, let's go and... Uh, Spend some time on Revelation 21 and 22, and I'm just going to go verse by verse with a little explanation, and that will be my time in this particular part of the lesson. Revelation 21.1, the Apostle John tells us that he saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. This verse tells us that our earth's atmosphere, the sky, which is really the first heaven, and the earth we're on, our planet, will undergo a total transformation. It will be new in form and quality. And boy, am I looking forward for a new planet. Our planet will be purged and renewed by fire and will be restored to its original state. In the second half of Revelation 21.1, and that's uh, purely a sentence, John tells us that, and there was no more sea. And I could be spending 10 minutes to really unpack that. But I'm going to give you the explanation that I think is best for you and for me to embrace. John tells us in Revelation 13.1 that the sea is where the enemy of God and his people come from. You see, you see that also in Daniel. Therefore the phrase, the sea is no more, can be understood metaphorically <clears throat> as the absence of evil. In the new earth, sin is no more. There will be no evil to cause fear and separation and suffering and death. There is no more sea. There is no more population coming through with evil intent. 
in, the, uh, <clears throat> in Revelation 21.2, John sees the holy city, the new Jerusalem, come down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. What a statement. This tells us that God's presence is guaranteed and that our lives on the restored earth will be free of pain and death. In Revelation 21.3, John tells us, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man, and God will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. This verse tells us that the actual presence of God makes the new Jerusalem the temple of the new earth. The new city is the temple of God. Magnificent. In this verse, God promises that He will once again make His dwelling place with people and be their God. And this is wonderful news for me. Then in Revelation 21 verse 4, we are told that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. God's abiding presence in the new earth defines the life of God's people in the new earth. You see, because sin is no more, there will be no tears. No death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. I want you to note, when Jesus dwelt on earth, just about 2,000 years ago, when he dwelt on earth, his presence banished tears and pain and sorrow. In the same way, the abiding presence of God in the new earth will ensure freedom from the pain and suffering we know today. In Revelation 21.5, the Apostle John affirms that God makes all new things, all things new. God will restore this world to its original state. And by the way, that includes you and includes me. We will have a new character and a body that is renewed. I am looking forward to that. So let's go to Revelation 22. In Revelation 22, verses 1 and 5, John is shown a river of life flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb in the middle of the city's main street. The river of life flowing the New Jerusalem contrasts with the Euphrates River, which flowed through ancient Babylon. At the Euphrates River, God's people sat as captives, longing for Jerusalem, as we read in Psalm 137. Well, now in the new Jerusalem, in Revelation, the new city, Babylon's no more. The captivity of God's people is over. Now at the side of the river of life in the new city, the new Jerusalem, God's people are free, vindicated, and find their eternal rest. If there is a promise for you and for me that you should embrace is salvation through grace and eternal life in God as victorious. In Revelation 22.2, John tells us that in the middle of its main street, the new city's main street. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits. Its tree bring its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. As we are told in Genesis chapter 3, verses 22, the tree of life symbolizes eternal life. Because of sin, humans, human beings lost access to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden and became subject to death. But now in the New Jerusalem, the curse is removed. Sin is no more. And the redeemed once again have access to the tree of life. And you and I, if we are redeemed, will see salvation, eternity, and purity in that tree of life every day of our lives in heaven. In Revelation 22.3, John affirms that there will be no more curse, 
the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it and his servants shall serve him. And then in Revelation 22, 4, John says, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their forehead. Oh, pay attention. This is an incredible fulfillment of God's promise. The greatest of all the privilege the redeemed will enjoy in the New Jerusalem is seeing God's face to face. Moses wanted so desperately to see God. And I hope that you and I have that desire. He dwells with us in our midst. The redeemed now sees God as he is. They serve him and worship him in his temple. And God's name is placed in their foreheads as the reward for refusing to have the mark of the beast in their foreheads. And finally, as we read in Revelation 22.5, the Apostle John tells us that the redeemed will reign forever and ever and ever. This statement brings about the conclusion of the great controversy and marks the beginning of the redeemed intimate fellowship with God. Oh, my friend, I really hope that you want that eternity Amen. for you, that you want to be with God and live with him in the new city. Amen. Mary, are there accounts to be settled at God's second coming? Yes, there are accounts. And for this part of the Sabbath school lesson, we're going to go back to Matthew 25. So as Jesus was finishing his ministry here on earth, he described to his disciples the condition of the church before his second coming. And he illustrates the conditions by sharing three stories. So one of the illustrations is the parable of the talents, and we're going to read that. So if you'll go with me to Matthew 25, we're going to read verses 14 to 19 first. For the kingdom of heaven, this is how the parable begins, is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded them and made another five. And likewise, the servant who had received two gained two more also. But the servant who had received one went and dug it in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So who is the one traveling into the far country? Well, this is Jesus, who ascended to heaven after his resurrection. And to whom does he deliver and entrust his goods? His servants, three of them. And the servants are those who have given themselves up completely to his will. Those who stand toward him and the relation of service. And what are the goods that he entrusted to them? Well, a talent in Christ's era was a weight, but it was also a sum of money equal to 15 years wages of a laborer. Some say that it would be the equivalent of a million dollars now. So the Lord had given them money to manage. Metaphorically speaking, one Christian commentator states, his goods also mean all the gifts and endowments called talents. It's your possessions and abilities, whether they are original or acquired, natural or spiritual, all are to be employed in the actual service of Christ. So notice, this includes our financial monetary possessions too, which we've studied a lot during this past quarter. So to every man is given a talent, and he cannot dispose of that talent and give it to another to do his trading. He must be a faithful steward. 
And the talents are the Lord's capital to be used, sanctified, and returned to the Lord, but improved by use. So what does it mean that after a long time, the Lord of those servants came back to settle accounts? Well, this means there's a review. There's like an analysis or an examination of what each of the servants put to use with those talents that they were given. In the book, Christ Object Lessons, page 360, we read, when the Lord takes account of his servants, the return from every talent will be scrutinized. The work done reveals the character of the worker. So that's important to note. Their work will be closely inspected and evaluated because it reveals who and what they truly are. Have they been transformed by the renewing of their mind? Do they have a new heart? Is God abiding in them? So that's what that evaluation is. Now let's continue reading Matthew 25 again, and we're going to read verses 20 to 23. So he, the servant who had received five talents, came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you gave me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you gave me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So the Lord called two of the three servants good and faithful. What had they done? How were their accounts settled? I want to continue reading in Christ Object Lessons. It says, those who have received the five and the two talents of so those stewards return to the Lord the entrusted gifts with their increase. In doing this, they claim no merit for themselves. Their talents are those that have been delivered to them. They have gained other talents. They multiplied those talents. But there could have been no gain without the deposit. If God had not given them that talent, they couldn't have multiplied it. They see that they have done only their duty. The capital was the Lord's and the improvement is his. But when the master receives the talent, he approves and rewards the workers as though the merit were all their own. His countenance is full of joy and satisfaction. He is filled with delight that he can bestow blessings upon them. For every service and every sacrifice he requits, not because it is a debt he owes, but because his heart is overflowing with love and tenderness. So he returns a favor to them for their service and sacrifice, and it's not because he owes them, it's because his heart is overflowing with love and tenderness. Well done, good and faithful servant, he says. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. It is the faithfulness, the loyalty to God, the loving service that wins the divine approval. They will enter into the joy of the Lord as they see in his kingdom those who, he, who have been redeemed through their instrumentality. So that's going to give us joy to see others in heaven with us. So let's find out what happened to the last servant. That's verses 24 to 30. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you know that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own interest. 
So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. So the last servant was called wicked and lazy. He excused his neglect of God's gift. He looked upon God as a severe tyrant, watching to spy out his mistakes and visit him with judgment. He claims that God demands what he has never given and reaps where he hasn't sown. But this servant has forgotten what King David said, that all things come from God and uh, of those things we give back to him. So all things are God by redemption and by creation. Therefore, the claim that God is a hard master is false. This servant is a liar. He has shut himself up to self-serving, and the gift diminished and was finally withdrawn. He who refuses to impart that which he has received will at last find that he has nothing to give. So I'd like to finish by reading just a couple of paragraphs from Christ Object Lessons. And this is a very sobering parable, for sure. But we need to know this. And Ellen White writes, Many who profess to be Christians neglect the claim of God, and yet they do not feel that in this there is any wrong. They know that the blasphemer and the murderer and adulterer deserves punishment, but as for them, they enjoy the services of religion. They love to hear the gospel preached, and therefore they think themselves Christians. Though they have spent their lives in caring for themselves, they will be as much surprised as was the unfaithful servant in the parable. To hear the sentence, take the talent from him, like the Jews they mistake the enjoyment of their blessings for the use they should make of them. Many who excuse themselves from the Christian effort plead their inability for the work, but did God make them incapable? No, never. This ability has been produced by their own inactivity and perpetuated by their deliberate choice. Already in their character, they are realizing the result of the sentence. The continual misuse of their talents will effectually quench for them the Holy Spirit, which is the only light. The sentence, cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, sets heaven's seal to the choice which they themselves have made for eternity. May God help us make the right choice for eternity. Thanks so much, uh, Mary. Greg, the Sabbath school lesson really comes to an end with keeping an eye on the prize. Eye on the prize. That's exactly. And that's a, a capital P for exactly. the prize, keeping our eye on the prize. Right. So today's lesson helps us to focus not on worldly prizes, but on heavenly prizes, namely in Jesus Christ. Right. And Paul tells us in Philippians 3, verses 13 through 14, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press forward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. As we know, Paul was a very well-educated man with a very sharp mind. It's one thing to be educated, but to not have a sharp mind. He had both, which uh, those are two qualities that would probably assure him of worldly success from our worldly perspective today. But Paul was convicted and converted by the truth in God as it is in Jesus Christ. And he decided to leave behind his ways of old and keep his eyes on the prize of Jesus Christ. Amen. And like Moses and others before him, Paul chose to put his trust and his faith in God, Amen. in Jesus Christ, and endured Many hardships, and you can read about these in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Hardships like beatings, stoning, imprisonment, sh being shipwrecked, having hunger, being cold, and other forms of persecution that he experienced. So the question is, how was Paul able to endure all this? Well, follow me 
in your Bibles, or you can follow on the screen. Let's open to Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 18. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Wow. What clarity and what conviction Paul has. And Paul realized that being a child of God meant to be an heir with Jesus Christ. And again, that the sufferings that he endured were incomparable with the glory that we'll receive in Jesus Christ. The question is, is do you and I have that same conviction that Paul does? As we face life's challenges and circumstances in this world, and as we face the coming times of persecution, and they will come, are we ready and willing to forego the creature comforts, the material prizes that we personally possess in our lives today? Are we willing to forego those for the prize that awaits us in heaven and on the new earth in Jesus Christ? That's a question we all need to ask ourselves and to pray about. We can only have conviction like Paul had, like Moses had, and others before us, including the reformers. Think of what they went through because of their trust and faith in God by having a close, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no other way. God doesn't promise us here in this life. He doesn't promise his children that we'll all be rich in this world, right? I know I'm not rich. Maybe you aren't either. In fact, he says that all who live godly lives shall suffer persecution. That said, what he does offer is better than any material wealth this world has to offer. And Paul tells us in Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So God isn't, he's not necessarily against prosperity or wealth. Rather, what he's against is the love of it. So will the motive and the means and the end in achieving prosperity and wealth in this world, will it be done and used to glorify him or self? Only God will know what the true motives of the heart are. And some of the most cutting and powerful words we're going to read in just a moment, but they're powerful cutting words of guidance and perspective that God shares with us in terms of keeping our eyes focused on him and our eyes focused on the prize in him and heavenly things, and not on the material wealth of this world. And it's presented by Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 7 through 12. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. In the King James, it's the root of all evil. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, this is his plea, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So, do you do this? Do I do this? And when it comes to our final days, if Jesus doesn't come beforehand, my prayer for me, for you, for all of us, is that we will do what Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 7-8. through 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. That's the crown of righteousness that Victor was talking about at the beginning. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day 
and not to me only, but also to those who have loved his appearing. May we all, through God's grace and his mercy, be able to say the same thing with the same assurance and conviction that Paul said. It's my prayer for you and me that we keep our eyes on the prize of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thanks so much, Greg. Thank you so much, Mary. What an incredible study. What an incredible quarter. The 12 lessons of this particular quarter have really, have really, to a certain extent, urged you and I to understand that God wants to establish a relationship with you daily, 24-7, 365. Not only does he want to establish a relationship with you, but he wants you and I, I, he wants us to be stewards of what he has done for us. We all have talents. We all have been given life. His breath is in us every second of every minute. He has gifted us, not only with talents, but he has given us everything that we need. And in turn, the Lord is saying to you and to me, everything that I have given to you, Victor, I have done so, so you may glorify me. Stewardship. You see, by faith, we enter into a relationship with God, and God wants so desperately to have a relationship with us. And we invite God, by faith, to dwell within us and guide us through a journey here on earth. As we become stewards of all the material and the spiritual blessings we receive from Him, God wants us to be faithful stewards. And so, when I go to Scripture, and I open Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 2, the Lord tells me, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. At the end of the day, a relationship that matters is a relationship that is based on faithfulness. If I only have a sporadic relationship with God, then that is not going to last very long. And then, of course, Philippians chapter 3, verses 14 Philippians 3.14 tells us, and this is Paul speaking, Philippians 3.14 tells us, I press forward toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. If there is somebody that I look at for inspiration regarding stewardship, Jesus is first because he was a great steward of God and of heaven. But Paul, as an apostle, was a very faithful steward to God. And so what does Paul says here? I'm going to be moving forward towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And the ultimate response to that goal is a crown of righteousness and an eternity with God. And then in Matthew chapter 10, verses 23, Matthew 25, 23, the Lord encourages you and I this way. He tells us, the Lord said to him, and he's talking about the, and I, this is in reference to your Wednesday talent Sabbath school class. I mean Sabbath school description. The Lord tells the worker. The Lord tells him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Faithfulness in stewardship has a quid pro quo response of rewards from our Lord Jesus Christ. 
I want to finish with a couple of verses. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 20. Galatians 2, 20. The Lord tells us um, in this incredible verse, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. This is now Paul testifying to his journey with Christ as a steward. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When I introduced the lesson earlier on, I mentioned categorically that there is nothing in me as a sinful human being that can take me to heaven and to salvation. Everything I need with a relationship with God is granted by God. And in essence, in order for me to walk like to, or to work with God, I've got to set aside my will and I've got to die for self on a day-to-day -day basis. Paul has urged us to do that every day. I don't know about you. I certainly have a relationship with God. I hope you do. And I hope that the relationship that you choose to, to, to have with God is a daily, constant relationship with Him, where He dwells within you and me, where He, through His presence and through the presence of the Holy Spirit, you and I have an opportunity to use the talents that He's given us and to take care of every blessing that he has provided so we may glorify him let's pray gracious heavenly father i just want to thank you so much for your amazing grace father i want to thank you that in you we can be provided with eternal life in you and at the cross lord you paid the price of our sinful nature and we have the opportunity to be redeemed by, by your blood on that cross. And Father, not only have eternal, et eternal life, but while on earth, here, before you come, glorify you with our deeds and our life. Lord, we want that. I want to thank you, Father, for the encouragement that we have in Scripture to give ourselves to you daily. Lord, to entrust to you our will and to ask you daily to die for self so that you may be, set, may be really in control of our thoughts, our deeds, our words, and our life here on earth. Thank you for the opportunity to be children of God, heirs of the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for all the promises that you've made. We are awaiting your second coming. Thank you, Lord. This will be a wonderful, wonderful time living with you in the same city, being able to be able to honor you, worship you, and see you face to face. And Lord, being able to glorify you, we cannot wait. Come, Lord, take us home, redeem us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.